Imagine the true understanding of the universe hidden within the life and teachings of a philosopher who lived over two millennia ago. I'm talking about Pythagoras, an enigmatic figure whose impact on science, mathematics, and philosophy can still be felt today. But the question that arises is, how can we separate the myth from the man and understand the pure essence of his contributions when the lens of time has distorted his image? Part 1 of the book, Pythagoras, Life, Science, and the Quest for Truth, challenges us intellectually to understand Pythagoras in all his complexity, not just as a scientist and philosopher, but also considering the cultural and religious aspects that surround his historical figure. Pythagoras was not just a mathematician, but a multifaceted figure whose philosophy of life was infused with rituals and symbolism. Studying Pythagoras's many experiences, we discover that many scholars of the past focus solely on one isolated aspect of his personality, either his philosophy or his mathematics, without giving due value to his religious and ethical beliefs, for example. To truly capture the essence of Pythagoreanism, we must observe the convergence of these multiple facets, avoiding simplistic analyses that focus on only one line of development. The passage presented to us indicates a mixture of ancient sources about Pythagoras, some reliable and others questionable. The importance of a new source, a fragment from Spusippus, a direct disciple of Plato, is highlighted, offering a unique view of Pythagoreanism that differs from Aristotle's reports. It is widely relevant to separate the Platonic and pre-Platonic material for a true evaluation of Pythagoras's legacy. A crucial figure is Aristotle, who separates and compares Pythagorean and Platonic doctrines. This is essential to understand the evolution of Pythagorean philosophy to the Platonic, a movement that directly impacted the development of science and mathematics, falsely attributed solely to Pythagoras. In this context, we are led to unravel the pre-Platonic mystery of Pythagoreanism, excluding influences that arose later, such as Plato's interpretation of Pythagoras. Natural history and the development of 5th century thought are elements that will help illuminate Pythagoras's role and his genuine contributions to philosophy, beyond the myth of the wise man and scientist. This is just the beginning of our journey in search of the truth about Pythagoras. We will continue delving into layers of history, science, and myth to reveal the figure of a man who has become almost legendary, but whose teachings continue to evoke admiration and curiosity centuries after his death. Together, we will peel back the layers of one of the most intriguing characters in human history. How can we capture the essence of a figure as multifaceted as Pythagoras? This is the challenge for scholars who dive into the enigmatic waters of ancient history, scrutinizing every sign left in this universe full of myths, discoveries, and divergences. Pythagoras reveals himself under multiple lights, sometimes as an insatiable scientist, other times as a transcendental mystic. Historians of science and anthropologists alike try to unravel this personality that, like an untamed flame, seems to exist everywhere and nowhere, eluding simplistic definitions. In this world of analyses and interpretations filled with critiques and admirations, one figure stands out, Pythagoreanism. This movement, marked by an almost unattainable coherence, is subjected to different analyses that oscillate like a pendulum between skepticism and faith in tradition. Unfortunately, primary sources directly related to Pythagoras and his followers are widely seen as apocryphal, of doubtful authenticity. Except for minor fragments related to Philolas and perhaps Archytas, what remains is an unstable foundation for constructing historical knowledge. And what about the reconstructions of Pythagorean mathematics? Those diagrams and theorems often claimed as a direct legacy of this enigmatic character. Since the early 20th century, careful studies have questioned not only the dating, but also the true influence of the Pythagoreans on the foundations of Greek mathematics. Layer after layer is stripped away when examining the accounts linked to Pythagoras himself, revealing a source of knowledge that is more rooted in non-Pythagorean science of Greece, inspired by the philosophies of nature in Ionia and Elea. And the transmission of ideas? Here we delve into the complex web of influences between Plato and the Pythagoreans, a connection that does not point to a one-way street. Platonic material, later mistakenly identified as Pythagorean, 
and the inflammatory work of Plato's immediate disciples raise questions about how much the Pythagoreans absorbed in contrast to what they offered. Thus, the study of Pythagoreanism becomes an equation that challenges definitive resolution, where philology itself pulsates in an arena between tradition and doubt. Although skeptics may find fertile ground, we cannot deny that even in the depths of this historiographic nebula, precious jewels of immense intellectual value shine, precious hints of a human saga that attempts to glimpse the truth behind the shadows of the past. And here, through science and mathematics, or through the path of mysticism and religion, the search for Pythagoras continues, the mathematician, the thinker, the sacred leader, the man behind the legend. In this passage, we delve into the intricate interaction between the thoughts of Pythagoras and Plato, and how the perceptions of these two philosophical giants have intertwined over time. Starting with the source of Numenius, a belief echoes that Plato and the great Pythagoras aligned in their ideals, emphasizing that even what Socrates had to offer originated from Pythagoras. This narrative of connection was not simply passive homage. Direct disciples of Plato emphasized Pythagoras's contributions, paving the way for high recognition of Pythagoreanism, a philosophical branch that drew many of its theories from Plato, Aristotle, and other followers of the Academy. The passage unfolds the complexity of this relationship by shedding light on the emergence of apocryphal Pythagorean texts from the 3rd century BC onwards, which sought to prove that the Platonic Aristotelian doctrines were actually teachings originating from Pythagoras and his disciples. Representatives of the Academy, such as Spusippus and Xenocrates, contributed to this reinterpretation of Pythagoreanism, culminating in a kind of reinvention of Pythagorean thought presenting itself independently from the Platonic tradition. In this tangle of influences, we see a paradox. While the Pythagoreans recognized the overlap between their ideas and those of Plato and Aristotle, they tried to distance themselves from historical Pythagorean teachings, which were rejected as superficial by modern critics of the Pythagorean school. A significant shift occurred when the Academy, which originally favored the blending of Socrates and Pythagoras promoted by Plato, lean towards a more Socratic skepticism, dissociating from Pythagorean influences. This branching resulted in two contrary perceptions. On one hand, the academics adopted a more skeptical stance and scorned the dogmatic teachings of Pythagoreanism, while on the other hand, the Pythagorean tradition still exerted enough fascination to be claimed by those seeking a more rationalistic philosophy. Paradoxically, this separation of paths ultimately led to a strange phenomenon. Plato and his students were accused of plagiarizing the Pythagoreans, even though it was the Pythagoreans themselves who claimed to be the original owners of Platonic ideas. This spectacle of influences and accusations constitutes a fundamental chapter in the saga of ancient philosophical thought, highlighting how intertwined the Pythagorean and Platonic schools were and how crucial their dialogue was for the development of what we now know as ideal number theory and philosophical mathematics. Imagine yourself in a room where sounds of an ancient lyre echo, its strings vibrating in an almost mystical harmony. You are now face to face with the innovative thinking of Philolas, a philosopher who walked the same paths as the great Pythagoras. It is not just music that resonates in the room, it is the science of sounds, the mathematics of music, a universe where numbers and notes intertwine, creating a melody of knowledge. Let's dive into Pythagorean musical theory and understand how Philolas conceived it. He establishes the number 27 as the foundation of tone, a number revered by the Pythagoreans, which, for Philolas, had a direct relationship with the structure of a cube formed by the first odd number. This gives rise to important distinctions in Greek music, the apodom and the desis, names given to subdivisions of a whole tone. Philolas sees the desis as consisting of 13 units, a difference observed between the numbers 256 and 243. The apodom, on the other hand, contains 14 units, and the minute difference between these two parts is called the coma. In a clever and somewhat mystical way, he decided that the number one should be established as the comma. Thus, the entirety of a whole tone is composed of 27 units, the difference between the numbers 216 and 243. 
Delving a little deeper into Philolaus's labyrinth, we see that he divides the whole tone into two unequal parts, the apotem and the deesis, and the difference between them is called the coma. Although these revelations may seem so arcane, Philolaus reveals here a special perception of the importance of numbers within musical theory. And this, my dear listeners, challenges the pure mathematical sense of musical intervals, inviting us to consider numbers in isolation. And there we go deeper. The fragment considered to be from Philolaus is decisively classified as one of the oldest records of Greek music. It is an archaic and precious evidence that invites us to reconsider musical scales seen as defective in those times, scales that had an incomplete range. The complexity increases when Philolaus ventures beyond the definition of deesis, coma, and even enters the territory of even finer divisions of the tone, such as the schisma and the diaschisma. With each name and number assigned to these divisions, a world emerges where musical meanings intertwine with mystical and philosophical meanings. Imagine a world where numbers are not just quantities, but gateways to endless possibilities. A world where the vibration of every string on an ancient lyre holds secrets about truth and knowledge. Welcome, my friends, to another captivating chapter of our journey into the life and genius of Pythagoras. In this section, we delve into the intricate realm where music, mathematics, and philosophy intertwine. We uncover the mysteries that lie within the ancient melodies and explore the deeper meaning behind Pythagoras's quest for truth. As we navigate through the pages of this fascinating book, we not only witness the beauty of antiquity, but also unveil the eternal concepts that continue to resonate in the realm of human knowledge. But our expedition doesn't end there, my fellow explorers. No, it takes us even further into the numerical legacy left by Pythagoras. Within the encrypted texts and riddles of the past, we stumble upon the study of proportions. Pythagoras, with his brilliant mind, unraveled the world of numbers and their intricate relationships. Through his narrative, we witness how fractions and units intertwine, revealing that Pythagoras not only comprehended proportions but used them to decipher the cosmos. However, we must understand that the way we perceive proportions today differs from how they were understood in ancient times. In those days, fractions held no place in Greek proportion calculations. It was a norm that Pythagoras and his followers embraced. This unique perspective reveals the occasional misunderstandings that arose, such as confusion between 1733 and 14 units. Moreover, this passage sheds light on the interpretations and later revisions of Pythagoras's work by scholars like Plutarch. It also highlights the errors in understanding made by others like Deals. These valuable lessons teach us how wisdom is transmitted and transformed over time, sometimes misinterpreted and other times enriched by the analytical minds that study it. As we continue forward, we carry with us the nuances of ancient knowledge that still echo in our modern world waiting to be rediscovered. Step by step, we assemble the grand mosaic of Pythagoras' life, a mosaic that intertwines science and mystery, leaving us in awe of his vast impact on the centuries to come. Now, let us embark on another exhilarating chapter. Imagine a time when the greatest thinkers of history, such as Plato, Aristotle, and Pythagoras, were shaping their theories about the universe for the first time. In this installment, we plunge into the depths of Pythagorean and Platonic numerical theories and explore their interpretations and adaptations across time. Plato and Pythagoras, two visionaries of their time, shared a unique perspective on numbers and their connection to the cosmos. Their groundbreaking theories, later scrutinized by other great thinkers like Aristotle, paved the way for a profound bond between mathematics and philosophy. This conceptual connection found various expressions in the works of these philosophers. It is fascinating to note how Aristotle, at times, echoed the playing with numbers that the Pythagoreans pursued, while in other instances he drew clear distinctions between his own theories and those of Pythagoras and Plato. The controversy surrounding the origin and correct interpretation of Pythagoreanism and Platonism is dense my friends. The records from that era present an ever-changing image of Pythagoreanism, with different traditions offering divergent portraits. This is where the challenge emerges. Aristotle's accounts had an undeniably antiquated tone, 
while the reported doctrines from the Platonic school demonstrated a sophisticated development of dialectics. Despite this complexity, Aristotle sometimes hinted that it was Plato, and not the Pythagoreans, who introduced the concept of the indefinite dyad, a notion fundamental to understanding reality in terms of dualities. Deep into the text, we delve further into the waters of ancient philosophical tradition, striving to separate historical truth from later interpretations. In our quest for true Pythagoreanism, we set aside the elements contaminated by Platonic interpretations and focus on statements that align with pre-Platonic and Aristotelian knowledge. Aristotle, who maintained a critical distance from academic and Pythagorean philosophy, contextualizes both with a polemical eye. Through critical analysis, we discover that the Platonic disciples' tradition presented Pythagoreanism in a way that did not reflect historical and philosophical reality. They overlooked the intellectual developments that took place over a century and a half, a period marked by thought revolutions. This approach led to a fusion of Pythagoras's wisdom with the doctrine of his master, Plato, a scenario that neither historically nor intellectually seems feasible. The outcome of our plunge into this historical and philosophical discussion reveals that derivation of the system is an achievement of Plato and the Academy, a genuine transposition of ancient Pythagorean numerical philosophy with some innovations introduced within the circle of Archytas. The Pythagoreanism we find in academic texts reflects this school of thought, yet it cannot be regarded as an accurate source for understanding historical Pythagoreanism. Therefore, my fellow seekers of knowledge, as we sail through the sixth chapter of this enthralling story, let us remember that we are unraveling the interplay between the foundations of numerical philosophy and the ripples created by its greatest interpreters and successors. Here we touch not only upon numbers and theories, but also how they were used to explain and understand the laws governing our universe, a mystery that continues to inspire and challenge thinkers to this very day. And now, my dear audience, let us venture deeper into the profound and revealing section of our journey, a section that explores how Pythagoras' wisdom intertwined not only with the ideas of his own disciples, but significantly with the philosophy of Plato and his academy. While Plato and his students embraced Pythagorean teachings, rejecting the intellectual advancements made over a century and a half, Aristotle distanced himself from these philosophies observing them from a critical and polemical perspective. We immerse ourselves in a discussion on how the innovative contributions of Arcus's school were incorporated by Plato and his circle to formulate a system, a system known as derivation of the system, that transformed Pythagorean numerical philosophy into a Platonic structure. While later traditions suggest the preeminence of Pythagoreanism over other philosophical thoughts, what truly emerged from Plato's academy should not be mistaken for historical Pythagoreanism. Wise minds will discern that Platonism largely derived and modified from Pythagoreanism. Explicitly addressing the direct influence of Pythagoreanism on Plato, the text closely examines the sources of inspiration for the philosopher. While Socrates, Heraclitus, Anaxagoras, and Parmenides are recognized as substantial influences, Fleeting references to Pythagoras in Plato's dialogues, especially in Timaeus, offer significant clues about the relationship between these two schools of thought. As for Pythagoras himself, he is mentioned in Plato's Republic, prompting a comparison between the contributions of Pythagoras and Homer in the practical education of people. Plato also alludes to the role of numbers in music highlighting the belief of the Pythagoreans that music and astronomy are sister sciences, investigating the numerical proportions that define musical intervals, and applying these concepts to the cosmos in their theory of the harmony of the spheres. From this summary, we can conclude that understanding the relationship between Pythagoreanism and Platonism requires us to identify their convergences and divergences. Rather than viewing Plato's teachings as direct echoes of Pythagoreanism, we should consider them as adapted and expanded fusions of Pythagorean wisdom by Plato's unique genius. It is within this historical and philosophical tapestry that we find the true essence and evolution of ancient thought. Now, let your imagination transport you to a world where the essence of all things is guided by a dance between the limited 
and the unlimited, a world where the harmony of music becomes a metaphor for understanding existence itself. Fasten your seatbelts, my fellow adventurers, as we descend into the eighth stage of our journey, exploring the deep connection between Plato and Pythagoras's pioneering ideas. In the text before us, we are encouraged to look back to the roots of ontology presented in Plato's dialogue, Philebus. Here we discover that the foundations of this ontology, examining the limited and the unlimited, were already woven in the minds of Pythagorean philosophers, especially in the delicate strands of Philolaus's thoughts. It is worth noting that this connection between Plato's ideas and Pythagoreanism was also recognized by ancient thinkers such as Syrianus, Proclus, and Damascius. While some modern scholars debate the origin of these concepts, suggesting they were genuinely Platonic rather than borrowed from Pythagoreanism and adorned with poetic myth and mysticism, the majority acknowledges the almost evident connection between these ideas and Pythagoreanism. However, Within Aristotle's own accounts, we find counter-arguments indicating that Pythagorean doctrines on the limited and the unlimited did not derive from Platonism, undermining the theory proposed by those scholars. The dialogue in Philebus offers valuable pre-Aristotelian evidence of a sizable Pythagorean philosophy enriched with musical elements. Yet, the great challenge lies in accurately distinguishing what Plato inherited from Pythagorean ideas and what he transformed within the crucible of his own thoughts. The answer to this enigma cannot be fully uncovered in Plato's words alone, but also in the hints that transcend the context and purpose of the dialogue itself. And there you have it, my friends, another thrilling glimpse into the magnificent worlds of Pythagoras and Plato. Join us on our next adventure as we continue to uncover the intricate tapestry of ancient wisdom stitched together by the greatest minds of their time. Welcome back, my fellow bookworms. Today we're diving into the fascinating world of philosophy in Pythagoras, Vita, Scientia, e Abusca Pela Verdade. In this segment of our journey, we explore the intricate relationship between philosophy, religion, and the search for wisdom. Picture it as a beautiful tapestry, where each thread represents an idea or theory that blurs the line between heritage and innovation. Now let's talk about the core of Pythagorean thinking, and its interaction with Plato's ideas. If you thought Pythagoras was just a wise mathematician, prepare to be amazed as we unravel the dance of concepts and influences between Pythagoras and Plato that persisted for centuries. While Pythagoras was deeply associated with Platonism in the early tradition, to truly understand Pythagoreanism, we need to go back to a time before Plato. Simply put, Pythagoras' original thoughts were both incorporated and altered by Plato's dominant influence. This Platonizing interpretation made a substantial change in the Pythagorean tradition. The works of Pythagoras and how they were preserved or distorted are closely intertwined with religion and the subconscious religious needs of the Hellenistic period. Interestingly, when people began declaring themselves Pythagoreans again from the first century B.C., their quest for divine and superhuman wisdom caught everyone's attention. This aspect might give us a genuine glimpse into Pythagoras' real origins, not so much in specific doctrinal details, but in the premise of possessing knowledge from a divine source. But listen up, folks. Pythagorean influence goes beyond doctrine. It also represented a way of life that some chose to follow seriously. In this context, Texts about Pythagoras' life and activities compiled by figures like Diogenes Laertius, Porphyry, and especially Iamblichus are fundamental. While Iamblichus focused on the appropriate way of life, rather than just a biography of Pythagoras, he offers one of the most detailed accounts of this legendary mathematician and thinker. As we delve deeper into the intricate relationship between Pythagoreanism and Platonism, we need to keep a critical eye to distinguish between different layers of interpretation and adaptation of the original teachings. And with that in mind, we continue to unveil how Pythagoras's legacy in both science and the pursuit of truth surpasses the boundaries of time, influencing us to this day. Now let's embark on an intriguing journey through the origins of Pythagorean thought and meet a prominent figure named Philolaus. Within the heart of ancient philosophy, lies a book that has withstood the test of time, Philolaus's book in Pythagorean tradition. 
This work, unlike many forgotten or overlooked texts, maintains its relevance and respect within the Pythagorean community. It's here, in this chapter, that we fully delve into the meaning and impact of this unique text. Now some argue that Pythagoras never devoted himself to writing, leaving his teachings in the memories of his disciples. Others see the attributed works as a mix of reverence and skepticism. The debate revolves around preserving the original teachings and the concern that every translation or adaptation may distort the core of Pythagorean knowledge. Moreover, the idea of an Iapo, Sixio, or sacred word of Pythagoras supposedly brought from Egypt adds mysticism and doubts about the authenticity and content of this sacred essay. But hold on, folks. This claim about the sacred word seems to originate not from Pythagoras himself or concrete writings, but from interpretations and additions made by others over the centuries. Even Plato warned about the dangers of written texts, echoing the complex relationship of the Socratic philosophers with pre-existing literature. However, it's undeniable that the legacy of Philolas carries an authenticity that few other works attributed to Pythagoreans can claim. Each fragment, each verse that has survived, including those eventually compiled in the late work known as Carmen Aureum, serves as vital testimony to the preservation and influence of the Pythagorean tradition. In this sea of forged writings attributed to Pythagoras and his disciples, it becomes a challenge to discern the truth amidst countless claims. And despite disputes and controversies, Philolas's book emerges as a beacon of legitimacy, guiding those who seek to understand the true Pythagorean teachings. As we navigate through the turbulent waters of history and tradition, Philolas's book offers a safe harbor, a place where we can anchor our search for truth. We know that despite doubts and shadows of the past, it is still possible to catch a glimpse of pure Pythagorean knowledge that has stood the test of time. So let's journey onwards, my friends, as we continue to explore the life, science, and tireless pursuit of truth that define Pythagoras's legacy. Imagine if you could cross the thin line between life and death, visiting hidden places where the secrets of the universe reveal themselves to the bravest or the most foolhardy. In the twelfth segment of Part 1 in Pythagoras, Vida, Ciencia y Busca pela Verdad, we explore the dark corners of the underworld and the rituals believed to offer healing, knowledge, and even glimpses into the future. In ancient tales about Pythagoras, we are introduced to metempsychosis, the belief in the transmigration of the soul after death to another body. Ancient Greek tales tell us about Leonymus visiting the White Island, originally associated with the underworld. There, he received instructions from Helen to pass on to Stesichorus so that his vision could be restored through his composition. These narratives go beyond the mystical. We enter into accounts of soul travel in a trance-like state, such as those of Formio and Hermotimus. The latter, in particular, was able to leave his body, which remained inert as if dead, to wander and make predictions about the future. Interestingly, the city of Clazomene even built a sanctuary in his honor, underscoring how society valued such abilities. These tales migrate to Croton, where Pythagoras is said to have originated. There, we find ancient beliefs that an ecstatic journey could grant healing through visits to another world, a realm of the gods. Reflecting the conviction that such transcendent experiences were intertwined with ritual practices, Croton was paved with legends of healing and visions from beyond. Empedocles, a close figure to Pythagoras in terms of being a contemporary, promised his disciples the ability to control the winds and even bring a dead man back to life. And not only that, legend has it that Empedocles even proclaimed himself a god because he could perform, or at least simulate, extraordinary feats. This is a clear indication that his narratives had their roots not only in stories, but in concrete events. To further solidify the connection between these ancient practices and Pythagorean teachings, we encounter allusions to underground chambers where Pythagoras held meetings with his followers. These stories intertwine with an account of a catabasis, a descent into the underworld, attributed to Pythagoras himself as a form of dark rituals and a search for divine revelations. In this world of complex rituals, hidden knowledge, and a blurred line between myth and reality, Pythagoras emerges as an enigmatic figure whose practices and beliefs resonate throughout eternity, 
revealing as much about humanity as the myths we spin around him. And how do these practices of transcendence connect with science and the pursuit of truth? Well, my friends, that's a story for the next segments of this intriguing journey through Pythagoras' legacy. Well, that's it for now, my fellow knowledge seekers. We've explored the intricate relationship between philosophy, religion, and the search for wisdom. We've unraveled the mysterious dance of concepts and influences between Pythagoras and Plato. We've also delved into the enigmatic figure of Philolaus and the authenticity of his contributions. And finally, we've touched upon the thrilling world of underworld rituals and the thin line between myth and reality. Stay tuned for the next segments where we'll dive even deeper into the captivating world of Pythagoras, Vida, Ciencia y Abusca Pila Verdad. Keep exploring, keep questioning, and never stop seeking knowledge. See you in the next video, my friends. Hey there, bookworms. Ready for another mind-blowing book summary? Today we're diving into the depths of ancient history with Pythagoras, Vida, Ciencia y Abusca Pila Verdad. In this segment, we uncover some peculiar rituals and myths, mysterious disappearances, and the search for historical truth. Intrigued? Let's get started. Chapter 13 takes us back in time, exploring Livy's narrative about mysterious abductions and hidden caves. These enigmatic rituals, associated with Trophonius, leave us wondering just how far ancient ingenuity could go. Can you imagine people being taken away by machines and vanishing into thin air? Talk about a real-life mystery. But wait, there's more. Livy's interpretation of the punishment of adulterers reveals the intimate connection between human cycles and marriage rituals. It highlights how crucial these celebrations were in ancient society. The idea that an unfulfilled life could be connected to mythical tales shows our eternal quest for deeper meaning in our human experiences. Now, let's dive even deeper into the past. The discussion takes us to the Age of Legends and the Temple of Helion from the 3rd century BC. The origin of these stories and the attributions to mythical characters like Trophonius add complexity to untangling the thread of historical truth. It's like unraveling a mystery within a mystery. And guess who else makes an appearance? Apollonius de Tyana. This mysterious figure visited Trophonius, adding another layer to the rich tapestry of ancient Greek history. With every step we take, we continue to weave the intricate mosaic of Pythagoras's life and work intertwined with the fabric of ancient culture and knowledge. Are you ready for a labyrinth of Pythagorean wisdom? Brace yourself, because the brilliance of antiquity still flickers like a guiding light, even if it remains elusive. Now, let's turn our attention to Philolaus an intriguing figure whose contributions to the Pythagorean tradition are shrouded in controversy. Philolaus stands out in the ancient Greek intellectual landscape, especially for his supposed work on numbers and cosmology. Scholars have long debated the authenticity of these fragments, questioning their origins. But here's the twist. Other works attributed to Archytas lean more towards acoustics and mathematics. The academic debate shows just how challenging it is to separate fact from fiction in the Pythagorean tradition. As we venture further into this treacherous terrain, attempts to decipher authenticity based on language emerge. Philolaus and other Pythagoreans may not have used the Doric dialect in their writings despite its prevalence at the time, but inconsistencies in manuscript traditions make this approach unreliable. Some writings are immediately marked as forgeries, revealing later philosophical influences that contrast with the earliest Pythagorean understanding of matter, form, and the duality between the sensible and the supersensible. Proving the genuineness of any work is often more challenging than proving its falsity. However, what we should look for is a guiding north, an interpretive tendency or purpose that helps identify the true author's hand. Even without definitive evidence, there are hints and contexts that invite us to take a closer look at the possibility that Philolaus did indeed leave a written legacy that endured into the mid-4th century BC. Legend has it that Philolaus possessed a book, which intriguingly connects him to Plato, who supposedly bought three Pythagorean books. In the midst of this intellectual battlefield, Philolaus's contributions remain crucial. His work delved into the complexities of number theory, and the mysteries of his time's cosmology. In a world of forgeries and interpretations, 
Distinguishing the genuine from the apocryphal isn't just a philological matter. It delves into the desires and trends of those who sought to shape Pythagoreanism in their own image. So as we wrap up this chapter of our journey, we can't claim with absolute certainty that Philolas's works are authentic. However, the discussions surrounding them shed a revealing light on how ancient wisdom was understood, reinterpreted, and ultimately preserved over time. Phew, that was quite the adventure through ancient history and philosophical debates, wasn't it? I hope you enjoyed this engaging summary, and if you did, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe to my channel, and stay tuned for more captivating book summaries. Until next time, keep exploring the fascinating world of literature, my fellow bookworms.